Hello, I'm Anne Ford. I'm a member of the English Language Unit, or the English Booth, as it's more commonly called. I've been working for the SCIC for the last uh, 22 years, and I work from French, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese. At the beginning of any interpreter's training, we usually begin by teaching them how to do memory exercises. So a speech will be given which may in fact be quite short and fairly straightforward. The interpreter is not allowed to take any notes and the candidate is supposed to try to memorize the basic lines of the speech, visualize it if it is easy to visualize, and remember that all the details do not need to be included, but the structure and the basic message need to come across. So this is just an example. The other day I was listening to the radio, listening to BBC Radio 4, as is my wont, and there was a particularly interesting programme which appears regularly on the radio, which is called From Our Own Correspondent. It is a compilation of reports from the BBC's journalists out in the field, in any far-flung corner of the world that you can imagine. This particular one came from a journalist who was based in Western Africa, and he was reporting from the Gambia. It is also a very colourful story, because it's the story of a little tiny village very close to a river, which is not difficult in the Gambia. Apparently it's crisscrossed by a massive number of rivers and streams. It's the story in particular of a very old man called Ali Sese. Ali Sese is bent and wizened and he is looking very, very old even though he's possibly only in his late sixties. His eyesight is failing and he is really looking very sorry for himself these days. However, had you seen him, say, 10 or 15 years ago, you would have found that he was the most important man in the village. And the reason for that was that Ali Sese was a hippo hunter. The village needed to be protected from the rampaging activities of the local hippopotami, if that is the plural of hippopotamus. The hippos would turn up in the village, particularly at night, and destroy all the crops in the fields. And the villagers were so fed up with this that they really needed somebody to come in there, troubleshoot, and get rid of some of these hippos. And in those days, the only way to get rid of them was the technique which is used by Ali Sese in his prime. What he would have to do was to creep up on the hippos while they were actually in the river. One thing you should know about hippopotami is that they're awfully dangerous if you meet them on land, because they can run a lot faster than you might imagine with their great bulk. And if you do meet them on land, you have to climb up a tree as fast as possible, because, by the same token, you must realise that hippos cannot climb trees. But you're in big trouble if you meet one, I can assure you. Not that I have any personal experience. Anyway, Ali Sisse would have to creep up on the hippopotamus while they were actually bathing in the river, bathing in the mud or whatever they do, and he would then raise to his shoulder a massive old shotgun and shoot the hippopotamus he was trying to kill. If he managed to hit the target, and it can't be that difficult since they're fairly large, the hippo would of course die. So what do you do then? You have an animal which possibly weighs several tons. How on earth do you get that animal back to land? Because there's no point in just killing them. Ali Sese made his living out of selling the products which can be obtained from hippopotamus skin or flesh. I can't actually remember whether people eat hippopotamus, but I have a feeling they probably do. So, how on earth is he going to get the hippo back to land? Well, this is where the story gets a little bit unpleasant, I'm afraid. He had to wait. He had to wait until the body which had sunk to the bottom of the river began to decompose. The body of the hippo decomposes and fills with gas. So, two or three weeks later, perhaps, I'm not entirely sure of the figures, the hippo's body would slowly and gracefully float to the surface. And because it is much lighter than it was before, perhaps, it's possible to drag it from the middle of the river to the river bank. So Ali Sisse used to make his living this way. And uh, you can imagine that he's a very sad and uh, defeated old man now because he's just not capable of doing the job. Even with a target the size of a hippopotamus, his eyes are just too weak and his vision too blurred to be able to do the job. He has lost the respect of his fellow villagers and he will probably die a very sad and lonely man. So it's a very sad story. 
And you may think the villagers are very sorry to have lost Ali Sese. The fact is that no young person wants to take on the job. There are no young people who think it's a nice idea to just hide in the bushes and shoot hippopotamuses all day. It's an unpleasant job anyway, having to dispose of the, the corpse afterwards. So, like many jobs uh, all over the world, it's something nobody wants to dirty their hands with. Luckily for the villagers, however, they are being saved not by young up-and-coming hippo hunters, but by the European Union. The European Union gives development aid to countries all over the world, including in particular the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. In the Gambia, as I understood from this report, they are helping the villagers in such things as irrigation and diversion of rivers and streams to, be used, to put them to the best possible use for agriculture. As a part of this project, in some areas of the Gambia, they're actually drying out areas to make it more possible for villagers to grow their crops. And if you dry up the rivers and you divert them, the hippopotamuses will have to follow wherever they go. And so in Ali Sese's village, they are perhaps fortunate because the hippopotamuses have had to pack their bags and move on to the next river. Thank you very much.